Welcome to the Change Log, episode 0.2.4. I'm Adam Stokowiak. And I'm Wynn Nedlin. This is the Change Log. We cover what's fresh and new in open source. If you caught us on iTunes, we're also on the web at thechangelog.com. And hey, look, we're also on GitHub. Yeah, check out some feature repos there from our blog, as well as some trending repos from GitHub, as well as our audio podcast. And if you're on Twitter, you can follow Change Log Show, not the Change Log. And I'm Adam Stack. And I'm Penguin, P-E-N-G-W-Y-N-N. Had fun talking to David Recorden and gang over at Open Source at Facebook, <laughs> rather about their open source projects. Hey, you might as well call them open source with all the projects they've got going on. That's true. Talked about Tornado and Hip Hop and 320, some cool applications that cover a wide range of technologies. Also, some new API advancements, OAuth 2 and Open Graph. Yeah, a lot of fun stuff going on there. But they were really excited too about uh, everything they were doing. Yeah, the passion kind of just oozes out of what they're doing. You can see it. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Adam, where can people catch up with us in person? Uh, the, the Texas JavaScript conference over at uh, Austin, June 5th. June 5th. And June you're 5th. you're going to be at uh, LessConf this weekend? Absolutely, yeah. Be over there uh, yeah, all weekend. Enjoy in Atlanta. Sunny Atlanta, Georgia. Great episode this week. Should we get to it? Let's do it. All right, we're joined today by several folks at Facebook to talk about open sorcery at Facebook. Uh, David, kind of the ringleader there in the conference room, why don't you introduce the folks and each of the projects? Sure. So I'm David Recorden. Um, joined Facebook last fall um, and work on open source and standards here at Facebook. As, as Wynn said, we have a group of um, five engineers here that work on a variety of open source projects. Um, who will go ahead and introduce themselves, talk a little bit about the projects which they work on, then we can dig into them, answer some questions. Hi, uh, this is Hai Ping. Uh, I joined Facebook about three years ago. I have been working on this project that's called Hip Hop Compiler, uh, which is basically uh, transforming PHP into C++, just to try to speed it up. Hi, this is Paul Buheit. I'm uh, one of the former friend feeders. We joined Facebook uh, last August, and I'm uh, going to talk about Tornado, which was the real-time web framework uh, that was extracted from FriendFeed and open source last fall. I'm Owen Yamauchi. I work on our iPhone application. I've been at Facebook for almost a year now, um, and I'll be talking about 320, which is our open source framework for iPhone developers. And I'm Scott McVicker, and I work on the hip-hop for PHP with hyping as well. I always love those those deep long introductions. There, they're always awesome. Especially when it's like five people deep. I was trying to write yeah, all, all the names down. And I, was, I, lost I, count. I was waiting one more. I had I wrote all the names down and, and kind of got the gist of us. We got David recording. We got High Ping. We got Paul Buhai. We got uh, is it Om Yamaguchi and Scott McVicker? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I don't know. Should we start with Tornado? Sure. Okay. Sure. Paul, do you want to describe Tornado a little bit? Sure. So Tornado uh, is actually a collection of useful parts, basically, that we extracted from FriendFeed. We took what we thought was probably most reusable, uh, most applicable to things other than FriendFeed, and also things that were uh, somewhat unique, and packaged them all up for, uh, for the world to use. And so it's uh, written in Python. It's um, actually relatively small. I, I keep getting this number wrong, but I think it's about 5,000 lines of code. So if nothing else, it's actually just a, an interesting um, and uh, an enjoyable uh, code base <laughs> to read through and, and get familiar with some of the uh, real-time non-blocking concepts that are becoming more important as more web services are trying to do things like, uh, like IM or, or uh, real-time updates in the way that FriendFeed or Facebook does. And the reason that that can be difficult with a lot of traditional frameworks is that they are based on a blocking model where uh, every request requires a thread or a process on the server. And so if you have thousands or tens of thousands or millions of users um, connected to your website, it, that means you have a connection open from every one of those web browsers at all times. So you need a web server that's ca capable of handling many thousands of connections simultaneously. And so that's really the, the most core uh, value provided by Tornado. But there's also a number of other uh, features in there like easy authentication modules for Facebook and OpenID and OAuth and Twitter and Google uh, and just a handful of other utilities that we thought were really nice to have 
uh, such as command line flags that are very easy to use. So who's using uh, Tornado besides Facebook? Do you know? Uh, Quora is using it, I believe. The, um, that's Adam D'Angelo's startup that's doing the uh, Q&A service. Uh, Brizzly, which is Jason Shellen's um, startup, they're doing a kind of like a, a Twitter client and more. I don't really know the, the complete vision, honestly, but they're, they, they've been in the process of switching over. Um, and I've heard of a number of other people using it, but I'm not sure which ones are publicly um, announced yet. But there's a, a fairly active uh, community. What get. is the, the Quora one you mentioned, the first one? Uh, Cora, Adam D'Angelo is one of the other, I don't know if he's officially a Facebook co-founder or what, what the status is there, but he was one of uh, Zuck's roommates early on and used to be the CTO of Facebook. And so he has a new startup called Quora, which is a, a Q&A service. I'm, it may still be in private beta. I'm not sure. It's pretty cool, though. And it, what it does, uh, part of the reason they use uh, Tornado is it does some of the same real-time updates. So someone might ask a question and then other people will add answers or edit the question. And because of the, the real time functionality, when you're looking at the web page, you'll actually see those updates come in as they occur. So you don't have to like reload the page to see if someone has added a comment. You'll actually see it pop in in real time. How would this uh, correspond to, I guess, some other technologies, uh, maybe in the Ruby space, like a bit machine or Node.js or in the JavaScript space? Uh, it's actually... Uh, comparable, uh, comparable approach where I, I don't know um, everything about event machine, but I know I think Node.js is based on a similar model where you have, um, I think they're all based fundamentally on the ePoll system call in, in Unix, which allows you to basically monitor a large number of file descriptors in an efficient manner. Uh, and so they're all just different wrappers around ePoll you know, at its heart, but done in different languages. So I think event machine, if I, and I'm probably getting this wrong, but I think it's kind of a hybrid of C++ and Ruby. Um, we actually tried to keep Tornado as pure of Python as possible. There is a small C++ module for Python 2.5, but 2.6, it actually is completely uh, Python-based. So it looks like with something this fast in the, in the middle tier, your data layer could quite possibly be the bottleneck very quickly. What is normally, uh, I guess, coupled with something like this to provide that sort of speed. Yeah, exactly. So we, th- this has actually been a, a fairly controversial point, I think, in the um, asynchronous web server community, <laughs> to the extent there is such a thing, uh, which is, do you try to make everything asynchronous? How do you handle that? Uh, and the approach that we took was that we found that making everything asynchronous was actually just annoying uh, because it, it makes your, your code... Um, fairly complex because it's full of callbacks. So we, we thought that the most important thing was that the, the external events, you know, web browsers or fetching external URLs need to be asynchronous because those are things beyond your control. But local resources such as a database, it's actually okay to block because you need for your database to be fast anyway. Uh, and so what we've, the approach we took at FriendFeed is essentially just to run a fairly large number of uh, front ends. In that way, we also circumvent the problem with the Python global inter- interpreter lock, which effectively limits Python to only be able to use a single core at a time anyway. And so what we would do is, you know, on an eight-core machine, we might just run 10 front ends, and then we would put them all behind Nginx, which is a very fast reverse proxy. Are you guys using this just at FriendFeed, or has it been folded into Facebook properties at all? Uh, I don't believe there's any uses at Facebook. Facebook, uh, as I guess the others we'll talk about, is largely written in PHP, um, so that it's not really something that can be easily adapted for, for use here. So in the lunchroom, you guys kind of divide up into the tornado and, and hip-hop crowds and, and throw gang symbols <laughs> and things? Yeah, it's a east side, west side kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a n- nice segue. Let's talk about hip-hop for a second. Yeah, sure. Uh, this is Haiping. Uh, so um, the major problem we're trying to solve is the uh, the CPU consumption problem on the web tier. Uh, the you know the, the intention is very simple. We just want to uh, speed up PHP. You know that way that it can take a lot less CPU, uh, which means a lot a lot less number of machines. Um, the idea was just to transform the PHP into C++ because you know syntax wise these two languages are very similar to each other. And you know we were just asking the question, 
uh, why C++ can run faster, but PHP runs a lot slower. Uh, after the transformation, you know, a lot of the dynamic symbol lookup can be eliminated. Uh, things are were dynamic in PHP can just become static in C++. And also, we do some type inference, you know, hopefully the, the code can be a lot more efficient. So that was the basic idea. And it took us two and a half years, two years, about like one and a half year of development. Uh, initially, we have three people, Ian Proctor, Minghui Yao, and I. Uh, we spent one and a half year of coding. Uh, we wrote a lot of code. And then it took us another one year of time, you know, six months of correctness testing and six months of rollout. So adding together is like one year of rolling out uh, to all the web servers we have. So right now, uh, nearly all the web traffic uh, is served by the hip hop compile program. Um, it's been running well. It's been running, uh, you know, with a lot of speed up. I think it's uh, 2x to 3x speed up. So uh, it's been working for us. How long did you say that you were in development of the project part of it? Like a year, year and a half? A year and a half, yes. We've been writing the code for one year and a half. Um, and then we spend like a lot of time just to make sure uh, it really runs you know, correctly, meaning like it's the same as what PHP does. And so what kind of resources did you have available like when you were in development? Was it just, just two people or was it a smaller, a small team? Three people. So Ian Proctor, Minghui Yang, and I, we have three people. And then after one year time, we have another three people join our team. So right now we have more people. We have a total of eight people working on the compiler. You know, we're still working very hard on more optimizations. So do you have to pre-compile your PHP code to take advantage of something like this? Uh, you mean other people have other people done similar work before? So if you're going to use uh, hip hop, does does your PHP code have to run through some sort of precompiler to get this performance boost, or is it still a dynamic language? Uh, the compilation only happens during deployment. So uh, during regular development, people continue to use the interpreter, uh, which doesn't require them to compile, so they can still write web pages really, 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 really fast. Uh, only when the code is ready to push, we'll just compile that into a binary and just push that binary. Are there any syntactical limitations, I guess, between a, the interpreted PHP code and what you guys can support from the compiled version? Very few. Uh, eval is one of them, which isn't recommended anyway. So uh, to support eval is pretty hard for us because it also takes away some of the organization we can, we can do. Uh, other than that, there's also two or three minor places we don't support, but otherwise, you know, almost all the features are supported. What would be the use case for uh, someone to, to consider uh, using this uh, PHP framework? I think it's more useful if you have large number of machines or you are running large-scale PHP code base, uh, you really want to save number of machines in your company, uh, then this might help. So the biggest gain really is just a reduction of the amount of machines needed and faster code, obviously. Yes. Um, the, a lot of people were confused. You know, maybe this compiler can help uh, making web pages serving faster, but that turned out to be a bigger equation. When you talk about uh, web page speed, you also have to count the network time, uh, not only from the browser to uh, your web servers, but also from your web server to backend servers, you know, to database servers, to memcache servers, you have to count all those network I/O time. Uh, what we are saving is only the CPU time uh, taken by the web servers. So, uh, depending on your the nature of your web page, that portion can be big or small. Uh, what we are trying to save is really the computation power or the number of machines. How did this project come about? Who had the the idea to uh, to take off and, and do this? <laughs> I had the idea, for sure. But um, it's, you know, Ian and Minghui, um, they, they just loved my idea, you know. And then when we got into implementation, it's everyone's idea, you know, how exactly to convert different kinds of PHP code into static C++ code. Then it's really just a teamwork. You know, we had to uh, just work out all the details. We had to solve all the problems we had. How far did you get in the process before you started enlisting support from, from your team and from management? I think I spent 
about eight months just by myself, uh, just to work out a prototype um, good enough to show people. Uh, it's very promising, you know, it does, it runs faster. Uh, that's the time I had the other two people joining me. Having worked in that corporate type of environment before, I'm just always curious of, you know, sometimes you have to show rather than tell, and it's just um, just curious of how far you had to get in the process to, before you could actually prove the idea. Well, so uh, you have to realize Facebook is a, a very decentralized uh, software engineering force. Uh, everyone is very talented, you know, people normally can identify problems by themselves and proposing uh, solutions by themselves. Um, I don't think our management, you know, never will say words to say you're, you're not allowed to work on something, especially after communication with other people. Your idea can be appreciated by other people or approved by other people. Um, no, no one said no to me, so I was able to continue. And we were able to even form a three people of a group to continue to work on this, even though we understood that's risky, right? Any time point, we could just say, you know, that doesn't work well and it could fail. So if we zoom out and we look at Facebook as it is now compared to previous to this project, what's, what's really happened and what's been the gain? Comparing to not having a compiler, right? Uh, then we will require more machines to run the same website. And there are some other benefits, you know, after converting the PHP code into C++, we were able to build uh, C++ libraries that the backend people can also take advantage of. You know, before the compiler, they were not able to call into PHP code base because PHP is not quite re reusable by other languages. But after the conversion, you know, we were able to build a small library, you know, that people can just take and just call into PHP functions. That's also very beneficial. So basically, we were just building a bridge between uh, our PHP programmers and C++ programmers. That's kind of cool. That's pretty cool. It's great that you have an environment that fosters innovation like that as well. Thank you. Speaking of, of innovation, <laughs> speaking of innovation, uh, I think one of the the coolest apps on the iPhone you know, is the Facebook application. And you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the 320 open source application is uh, the the project is kind of the underpinnings of that. Who do we have to to speak to 320? Uh, this is Owen. Um, so yeah, I'm currently the developer of Facebook's iPhone app. Um, and yeah, 320 is uh, originally. It was extracted from Facebook for iPhone by the original developer, Joe Hewitt, um, whose name you probably know. Um, so it wasn't really developed with a sort of overarching theme. It was just a set of things that he considered useful uh, or potentially useful to other developers. Um, and yeah, 320 powers a lot of what the iPhone app does, including its infrastructure for doing network requests. Uh, it does... Um, caching on the file system and in memory and network request queuing as well as uh, URL routing internal to the app. So the app opens different views within itself um, through this internal URL mapping and routing mechanism that 320 provides. Um, other stuff that 320 provides is like large scale pre-made native controls, like an interface that mimics the message composing UI of uh, the iPhone systems mail.app. Um, which we use in the Facebook app for composing an inbox message. Other stuff includes um, essential, what it essentially comes down to a re-implementation of a CSS-like layout engine, which allows you to describe uh, the way a set of views should be laid out or the way an individual view should be drawn. Um, those are sort of the main benefits that, that 320 gives us. How does a how does a project uh, keep up with the ever evolving Apple platform, iPad, iPhone, stuff like that? Uh, so three twenty, one of one of our main focuses. So I'm not the only person who works on three twenty. By the way, a uh, former intern of ours named Jeff Verkoyan has also done a lot of great work on it. Um, adapting three twenty to be usable by iPad developers is a pretty high priority for us because. You know, it contains a lot of useful stuff, but in its current state, um, it's not really suitable uh, for the iPad because it makes a lot of assumptions about screen size and a, a couple of other things. Like, it's, uh, it would take some effort to make it compatible with, for example, the, uh, the split view metaphor uh, that 
the iPad that is standard on the iPad. By split, you mean you know portrait or landscape? Uh, no, that that part is fine. It's just um, by split, I mean having one scrollable list on the left and another scrollable list on the right, for example. Um, sorry, I've kind of forgotten what your original question was. <laughs> My, my res- <laughs> that's okay. What I wanted to know was, you know, as you guys evolve 320 in this code base, how do you uh, continue to just keep up with this ever-evolving Apple platform that we're dealing with be- between, you know, we had the iPhone for a while, we have many applications, lots of different opportunities out there, and now you have this bigger platform called the iPad. How are you evolving 320 to, to manage both platforms? Um. It's not really clear at this point. Like our work on adapting 320 to the iPad is in its very very early stages, because um, there's there's a lot of like code architecture decisions that we need to make, and some of them it's not really clear what the best choice is. Um, so yeah, I don't really have much to say on that front. As far as the evolving Apple platform in the sense of new features that they introduce in the SDK, um, you know. Generally, we, we sort of look at those as they come out and, you know, keep up with when they deprecate certain things, which is pretty minor. Um, for something like OS 4.0, which where the SDK is going to have a bunch of new features, it remains to be seen, like, which ones of those will hook into 320. Uh, some of it depends on if we decide to use those new features in the Facebook for iPhone app. Like, that's, um, that's a major driver of putting new stuff into 320. Like, if our iPhone app requires it, um, and 320 is a good place for it, then we do that. We certainly applaud you for one of the better Objective-C iPhone open source projects out there. Uh, are you up to date on kind of the state of open source and Objective-C, especially in the iPhone, and, and what other good projects are out there that folks should check out? Um, well, just to start with, uh, a lot of people have actually made forks of 320 where they put their own modifications on top of it. Um, and some of those are actually pretty good. Like they, they implement a lot of new features. Um, and th- those forks are divergent from our implementation. And we're probably not going to reintegrate those into mainline. But it's still uh, well worth checking out. As far as other, um, other frameworks for the iPhone, I, I don't know of any that are as sort of broad-ranging and comprehensive as 320. Um, I actually don't know very many at all. Like the ones that I do know have very specific purposes like, um, serializing and deserializing JSON, uh, translating between JSON and objective C objects that is, uh, or providing sort of object oriented uh, interface to SQLite. Those are the, those are the kinds of things we can make use of. Um, but no, really as far as the state of open source iPhone libraries in general, I think, you know, there's a lot less there than there could be. 320 is pretty big and in fairly wide use, but um, I really don't know of that many others, which sort of suggests to me that it, there isn't really a thriving open source community in iPhone development. So uh, was that all the projects? I'm looking at my notes here. We got Scott McVicker left over. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, so Scott, you just got to at least say Facebook for the folks at home. <laughs> <laughs> I met the guys at a recent during what conference was it during? A Twitter uh, chirp, I oh, guess. Yeah, it was chirp conference, and well, then to redact that, I should mention Twitter on uh, the Facebook podcast. So it was at a certain unknown social media uh, <laughs> conference, right? Yeah, and they noticed that my accent's a little on the strange side, and I can't actually say the name of the company I work for properly, <laughs> so <laughs> it's pronounced <awesome>. Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> So Scott was telling me at, a, at the meetup that uh, maybe this is a nice segue into just general uh, Facebook working and slinging code at Facebook questions. Scott was telling me that you guys are all friends with, with Mark on Facebook. Is that right? With, with Zuck? Uh, so, yes. so I think it was like you see him walking around and he's like very involved with the company. He doesn't like he's there. Yeah, I mean, I think Zuck even wrote a patch for one of the – like features or fixing something that was we were going to roll out at F8 a few weeks ago as well. So, so you're still in the code, huh? Yeah, I was going to ask. Yeah, now and then. Well, it's good to have the, the guy at the top of the company still slinging code. Yeah, I mean, I think it really speaks to the engineering culture that we have here in terms of both what 
Haiping was talking about earlier in terms of being able to go try out an idea, see if it works, work with other engineers or small teams, um, and really the entire company and products moving forward from an engineering perspective. Um, our entire design team uh, writes code as well. So generally when we get a mock-up, it's something that you can click on. It's not just um, a Photoshop file that's delivered. So I think that really has a huge impact on how we build products and how we build infrastructure. A lot of people really care about what they're doing. It, it shows through. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So David, well, your a question, but uh, a statement too. So David, your title, I guess, is Senior Open Manager. I don't know. We made something like that. <laughs> now, that's what your Facebook page says, and I guess at the PGA that means something totally different. Uh, <laughs> so. Talk a minute about your role and, and kind of how you herd cats or or sling open source at, at Facebook. Yeah, I mean, I'm really focused and um, my team's focused on making it really easy for anyone at Facebook to use open source, to use standards, to create open source technologies, to release them, um, and just helping the company make sure that we do a really good job of that. Um, and not just from an engineering perspective, but making sure that's pulled in from a marketing perspective or recruiting or um, even legal stuff now and then. Um, open source licenses are a lot of fun to go and understand. Um, but really that fundamental goal of making open source and standards really easy to use as a company, easy to create, easy to release, um, going and building developer communities around them. Lots of innovation happening on the platform too. So uh, you mentioned F8 earlier. Uh, you guys had the Open Graph and uh, OAuth 2 that, that came out of the conference and have seen a number of wrappers for both uh, emerge practically overnight for just about every language out there. Uh, why don't you tell the folks at home what uh, each of those aims to solve? Well, sure. I mean, so the Graph API is a really simple API that allows developers to go and um, interact with user data that users have given them ac uh, um, access to, um, being able to go and sort of, it's, it's extremely restful. A lot of ideas were inspired by the FriendFeed API. Um, and then we use OAuth 2.0 for all of our user um, authorization to that. So really got involved in helping drive the OAuth 2.0 standard inside of the IETF. Um, it's really simple. Um, if you've played with OAuth 1.0, you had to work with signatures. You had to figure out multiple types of secrets and tokens. With OAuth 2.0, has specific flows, whether you're in a web browser, or a desktop app, a phone, an Xbox. You get an access token. Then you just make API requests over SSL using that access token. Um, so that's been going extremely well. Um, developers are really loving both the Graph API as well as just how much easier OAuth 2 is to work with. Um, and then we also released the Open Graph protocol, which allows you to add some basic metadata to any web page so that users can go and connect to it um, inside of a social graph and so that they can um, like that page. And that, that page is really represented well with a graph so that we understand what type of page is it? Is it a movie that the user is interacting with or is it a website? Is it an article? Um, as well as some other information such as title and stuff like that you, that you want to know. I noticed on the Open Graph Protocol page that kind of gives the overview that one of the examples is IMDB. Have they implemented anything with, with Open Graph or was that just a kind of a, a use yeah, case? So that IMDB um, still has some of the... Um, the meta tags that we were playing with and prototyping before F8, um, they're working on going and using the Open Graph Protocol tags themselves. Um, if you check out Rotten Tomatoes, you'll see them there. If you look at CNN, you'll see you'll see them there. Um, they're definitely starting to spread around the web. How does Open Graph compare to other um, technologies that that are kind of similar, like OEmbed or perhaps microformats? Mm -hmm. So I think microformats is probably easiest to start with. Um, Microformats really came about by looking at how are people marking up semantic information in the bodies of web pages um, and trying to create some patterns around that. Um, we're using the, an RDFA syntax, which is basically a way of saying, like, you put the quotes a little bit different than if you were using microformats. Um, we try to reuse the microformats um, H card schema when we're talking about contact information, um, but really just wanted something that was dead simple for developers so that they can literally copy and paste four meta tags, place them into the head of their page, and have it work. Not have to go and dig into the body of the HTML, not have to worry about namespaces and different schemas to combine things together. Um, and the other thing you asked about was OEmbed. I guess OEmbed is more 
it's an API. So you go and you take something like a YouTube video page, you discover the OEmbed endpoint, and you, I think you actually make an API request about it, and that returns a JSON object describing some metadata. So I think the Open Graph Protocol really aims to be simpler than that from a developer perspective, not having to stand up another API, not having to go and make an additional HTTP request. You know, Adam and I both make our, our livings and our day jobs on the, on the front end. And just my initial take was, you know, with, with microformats, you know, I got excited when they first came out. But to tell you the truth, just even as someone that makes his living doing front-end code, every time that I wanted to construct one, I'd have to go out and look at an example. Just, you know, the, yep. it's just complex. I have the book um, right there next to you. <laughs> <laughs> and when I, got, I got excited when I saw Open Graph because my initial reaction when I saw the meta tags was, wow, well, how come we didn't think of this sooner? <laughs> well, thank you. I mean, there's really a whole team of people. And I think some of this, a lot of this comes from the fact that we were working with a lot of different partners and getting feedback from large publishers on what they were willing and what they weren't willing to go and do. So like one of the things that we discovered is there's a link tag where you, it's link rel canonical. And the goal of that is that you say, this is the canonical URL for a page. So the example is if you have a bunch of like query parameters, then a search engine can know ignore the query parameters, this is the actual um, canonicalized URL. And search engines understand it. And so we were thinking of using this tag instead of the OG URL property. But when we went and started talking to some large publishers, they were afraid that adding this tag would have potentially negative effects on their search engine optimization. And so really wanted something separate rather than having something that was tied into what they were already doing from an SEO perspective. It's about that time where we ask everybody you know, what their and what's on their, their open source radar, more or less? What's out there in the open source world that's just got you excited about uh, what you're doing? And we just kind of wanted to go around the room. I guess we can, David, if you want to lead this, you, you can, and just kind of go in turn with, with who wants to go next. But pretty much the question is, um, you know, what's on your radar in terms of open source, and what are you just on to play with? Oh, so what's on my radar? Um, I guess for me, it's this... I get, we're seeing more and more examples of how you can really use open source to go and scale large websites. And it's no longer that open source is just the text editor that you use on your computer or your mail client um, or only your database. Um, but I think open source is really moving beyond that traditional LAMP stack. And that you're going and seeing um, other technologies which are becoming really relevant in building scalable dynamic websites today that are open source um, that are working really well. So I guess sort of that, um, that evolution is pretty interesting to me. And I guess one question we probably gleaned over earlier, which was uh, probably something you kind of hinted on there, but how has GitHub as part of open source impacted how you feel about open source now and where it's going? I mean, we love GitHub. Um, it's an incredible web interface to go and manage a project, to go and browse through source code, um, and I think one of the most interesting things is how GitHub really went and embraced that idea of forks. So instead of saying that forks are a bad thing and trying to um, and trying to ignore forks, GitHub really gives you the ability to easily see who else is going and working with your code, even if they haven't directly submitted a patch. And so that really allows us to go and see what are other people doing on a project like Tornado or on a project like 320 from a much more proactive fashion. Very cool. And I guess uh, who would be next to answer the radar question? And if you want to answer the, the GitHub part of it, too, you're welcome to. So I'll answer it, but I'm going to cheat. <laughs> so let me say, I think uh, maybe the, the what I'm most excited about in the open source world is a, a couple of the projects that are still in the pipeline here at Facebook. I think there's, <laughs> I think there's a, a couple of cool things that'll, that'll be out uh, in, the, in the coming year. And um, we love scoops. Mentions? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I mean, I agree with everything about GitHub. I think it's, I, I, it's a great example. I mean, not only is it a really great product, but it's a great example of how you can have a, a space that's been around for a long time. You know, things like SourceForge and everyone kind of, or Google Code, and everyone kind of assumes that, you know, that's a, as good as it gets. And then all of a sudden, someone comes along and does something that's just fundamentally different. And once it's there, everyone sees it, and you're like, wow, why didn't you know, why didn't we do that sooner? Uh, so I, it's really, it's just a cool, cool company. 
I really like the network overview on GitHub where you can see all the forks and it's got a visualization of the branches and what commits went into the various branches so you can like pull things back in. I think that's pretty awesome. Yeah, this is Owen again. And sort of uh, related to that, the thing that's impressed me most about um, about the open source community that's grown up around our stuff is like the quality of the contributions that we get back. Uh, like We've gotten plenty of, of pull requests from people who have forked 320 in GitHub. Um, and a lot of those we've actually integrated back in. We have at least 16 separate contributors to mainline right now. Um, most, of, most of them are in the form of just uh, little bug fixes and patches. Um, but, you know, th that makes our life so much easier. Like if someone reports a bug to 320, that's one thing. But if someone reports a bug and includes a patch that fixes it, that's even better. And that happens actually fairly often. And that, that's, that's been one of the best things about, about open sourcing 320. Has uh, GitHub and, and just having open source project profiles available impacted the hiring process over there at all? Um, I don't know specifically. That's a good question. And that's all we get. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I could make up an answer if you want me to. But, um, no, I was actually, I mean, I was interested in seeing... Um, a blog post by Matt Bidolf, who created Doppler and then sold it to Nokia a few months ago, where he was actually going and um, analyzing GitHub network statistics for each city, looking at um, who were some of the most interesting contributors. And he was using that, I believe, from a hiring perspective. Um, so there's definitely something there um, if you want to play with it. Well, we certainly appreciate your time today. Um, anything to add before we wrap? I mean, I guess the only other thing is Google Summer of Code. Um, we're actively participating in that this year. Um, all three of Hip Hop, uh, Tornado, and 320 have um, students working on it as part of Summer of Code. Um, so that's definitely another thing that's really exciting for us. When does that take place? Uh, so Google Summer of Code is, I think it's actually starting within the next few weeks if it hasn't started already. Um, it's entirely distributed. So um, Google goes and helps projects find um, college students um, and gives them an internship over the summer um, remotely to work on open source. I just pull up the page down here now. That's that's pretty cool. Wow. All right. Thanks, guys. We appreciate it. Yeah, and um, facebook.com slash open source if you want to learn yeah. more about our projects and um, other stuff that's going on there. And also github.com yeah, GitHub forward slash Facebook as well. It's uh, basically the same thing. But hey, thanks guys for coming on the show. We really appreciate all all you uh, you had to share with Open Source. We appreciate uh, your wisdom and standing on the shoulder of giants and out there doing what you're doing. It's it's super awesome. We certainly appreciate it. Yeah, thank thanks. you for having. Thank you for listening to this edition of the Change Log. Point your browser to tail.thechangelog.com to find out what's going on right now in open source. Also, be sure to head to github.com forward slash explore to catch up on trending and feature repos, as well as the latest episodes of the changelog. Change log.